Welcome. It looks like we already have some folks rolling in. Welcome to the Just Tech Fellowship info session today. We're going to take a few minutes to let uh, more of our attendees arrive. So whatever you might need to do to help yourself settle in, please do, whether it's like grabbing some tea or water or just closing down any other distractions. We'll get started in another few minutes um, once more of our attendees arrive. In the meantime, we'll play a little music for you. Thanks for being here, y'all. And welcome again to anyone who's just arriving. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the fellowship info session. We're gonna give a few more minutes for more folks to settle in and arrive. So please do anything you need to do to take care of yourself. Another hello to any newcomers. Welcome to the Just Tech Fellowship info session. We're just a couple minutes away from getting started, so feel free to do anything you need in the next minute or so to settle in. Thanks for being here. We'll get started in a minute. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is BJ Starr. I use they, them pronouns, and I will be co-facilitating the Just Tech Fellowship info session today. I'm really happy all of you are here. We've got this funny setup where we on the panel can really only see each other and not you, but I feel you out there. I see your names popping up on the list, and I'm really glad that you're here. Today is going to be a really great session to learn a lot about the fellowship, to meet some of the fellows and get some of your questions answered about this very dope opportunity. So thanks for being here. I'm just going to go over a few kind of expectations and invitations uh, for our time together today. First, um, 
again, we can't even see you. So <laughs> you can leave and return at any time that you need to for any reason without giving us a heads up. Just take care of yourself as needed. We are recording this session. There will be a transcript of this session. So if you miss out on anything, you'll be able to tune back in to things you may have missed out on. Um, we will make it available, the recording, as I said, uh, but we do ask that uh, for the privacy of folks here that you don't record or take any screenshots um, of the session. Your cameras will not be on, so you can't see each other. You will only be able to see the folks here on the panel for today. And we expect this to be a really great session, but if anyone gets really disruptive in the flow of the session, uh, we'll just have to remove you. Um, <laughs> and the invitation there is to, to just tune in and interact in, in a way that supports the flow of today's session. It's such a brief time, an hour flies by, so we want to make the most of every moment of it. And for those of you who would like to change some of the um, settings and like interact with us, one option that you have is the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So you should see a little thought bubble that says Q&A, and that's somewhere that you can drop questions that you have throughout the session. I see one question that came in from Jacqueline about whether or not we'll be recording um, this session and whether it'll be available. And the answer to that is yes. So <clears throat> I've gone ahead and answered that one. So as you have questions, feel free to drop them there. Uh, we've got a couple folks who'll be monitoring that Q&A box. So feel free. The next is if you'd like to change your name, um, your preferred pronouns and your location, you can click on your um, screen bubble or you can click on the participant um, icon at the bottom of your screen and hover over your name and click more where you can then rename yourself. So again, we can't see you, but we can see the names of attendees who are here. So it's, it, it's wonderful if you wanna update that and let us know a little bit more about who you are and where you're tuning in from. Lastly, if you would like to enable um, closed captioning, you can get a live transcript of this session. There is an icon at the bottom of your screen, once again, that says show caption, captions, it's the CC tool. And you can click on that and it should enable the transcript. And if English is not your preferred language, you can also select any other language that you would like it to be translated in. So you would just click the little carrot to the right of show caption, and that'll give you some options there. We wanna hear from you all um, as you ask questions. We know not everyone's first language is English. We know not everybody speaks the same jargon either. So we ask that you just speak as plainly as you can and don't worry about grammar. Uh, we just, we really just wanna hear from you. So without further ado, I will, um, introduce us to a couple, few folks who are here. Uh, in the Zoom, you'll see us popping in and out of video at different times. Um, we have the Just Tech director, Catalina Vallejo, uh, who's here with us. You can wave at everybody, Cata, so we see you. We also have uh, two of the fellows who'll be tuning in uh, momentarily, Kim Gallen and Mimi Stiles, who'll be here with us talking about their experience. And then we have um, Eliana Blam and Rodrigo Ugarte, who are also on the Just Tech team, who will be monitoring our Q&A box and helping us out with tech and slides throughout our session today. So thank you all on the team for making this happen, setting up this info session. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'll pass it to you, Katha. Hi everyone and welcome to this info session. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and I just want to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about the Just Tech program. What is it that we do um, and um, to talk a little bit about our goals and then I'm delighted to have two of our fellows here so um, then I will pass it to them. So I want to start a little bit with uh, what is it that we do at the Just Tech program. So um, our program 
uh, focuses on centering the perspectives of minoritized and racialized people most impacted by tech harms. So our focus in our work is at the intersection of technology and social justice. And the way we do this is through two main initiatives. Um, the first one is the fellowship, which is the one that we're discussing today, that is um, committed on deep investment in non-traditional um, tech social justice leaders to allow for time to rest, to restore for restoration and radical imagination. And then the other part is that we're very invested in field building. Uh, we want to create and document a network um, that we see more as a community of these leaders um, through different initiatives. And one of them is our platform that includes different type of content that once again goes back to that reflection about technology and, and social justice. And um, now I wanna talk about our main five goals. What are the main five goals for the fellowship? And I think this is important as you, um, some of you are considering applying or preparing your application. So for us, the first thing is that we want to champion vital investigation into tech's impact and its potential for both harm and benefit. Um, we wanna center historically marginalized perspectives. We wanna build and sustain a diverse community of researchers and practitioners coming from different sectors, coming from different disciplines, coming from different um, questions about tech and social justice. And we also want to reimagine how to invest in people. Um, so, and this our fellowship is a unique model, right? We want to invest in people in a way that is sustainable and that it focuses on care and collaboration. And then we also want to facilitate and participate in envisioning and building um, toward a technological future that celebrates, celebrates and manifests justice, agency, knowledge, and um, joy. And, um, now I wanna talk a little bit about what the fellowship supports and why I was um, saying that we are a very different model of funding. Um, the first thing is that we provide unrestricted direct funding to individuals. Uh, we do not um, accept applications from organizations, um, but um, the reason for this is because we want to focus on the person as a whole. So not only we provide $100,000 a year for two years, um, we also provide supplementary funding for the whole person. And we believe that investing in um, individuals were also investing in a collaborative um, community. So when we're thinking about the model of the whole person, um, our reflection here is that you um, as a researcher or you as a community organizer, or you as an artist, you don't only need money to carry in a specific project, right? It's not only about the project and then neglecting the person. Uh, we understand that for all of us to live our best lives, but also to do our best work, we need of support. And um, in addition to those 100,000, we provide a what we call a supplementary package that we hope will be directed to health, to dependent care or childcare. It could be, um, you know, we all have different needs and our families have different needs project funds, equipments on materials, or even to um, invest in the community that you that you are trying um, to build. And um, now I wanna talk a little bit about um, who are the Just Tech Fellows. And um, in this, we our, our theory of change is that transformative and collective public impact requires of cross-sector collaboration and community building. So for us, it's very important to highlight that there isn't one field that can bring change, right? That what we need is this um, ongoing conversation between people from very different backgrounds. So um, just like fellows are artists, are journalists, are scholars, are also organizers, um, and more are also those who have been, who come from communities who have been impacted the most by the harms, uh, some of the harms that technology um, can cause. And then the other thing is that we take a very um, capacious um, understanding of uh, what research is. So for us, researchers are not only those who are in universities producing academic outputs, but researchers also live in artist communities, um, are also journalists doing um, very careful investigation about the effect of tech. Um, and it's also organizers working in the communities that are mostly um, affected by them. So 
Um, now, um, and, and given all of this explanation about how diverse um, uh, the Just Tech Fellows are, I want to introduce our first cohort of Just Tech Fellows. They started their tenure in August, and it will go until 2024. And um, I'm delighted to have all of them here. We're going to put more information on the chat about who they are so you can get a better sense of what are the projects that they are working on, what are the great things that they've done before joining the fellowship and during their fellowship, even when it has only been six months, they all have been doing amazing things. And today is wonderful because um, we have the fortune of having Kim Gallon and also Mimi Styles. And I'm going to pass it to Kim and Mimi, who will be chatting uh, with you a little bit more about their application process and how has it been for them um, to have this fellowship. Kim. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Terrific. Yes. Um, I'm Kim Gallen. I have the the privilege and the benefit of being one of the Just Tech Fellows this year, the, one of the uh, inaugural fellows. Um, and with that, I feel like it comes a, a little bit of a responsibility because so much um, time and effort has been put into this program, and rightfully so, for people to support the work that people are doing around Just Technology. Um, it's been an incredible first half of the fellowship, and I'm here today just to, to talk a bit about the application process. Uh, I will say that my work um, covers uh, health equity. Many of you uh, might know that I started a uh, organization called COVID Black to respond to the issues around data uh, and Black communities um, out of the pandemic. Um, and that work has now been uh, supported and continues to be supported by the Just Tech Fellowship. Uh, I'll just speak briefly about my experience applying for the Just Tech Fellowship. Um, when I applied, uh, wow, it seems like a long time ago, well, even as it seems like a short time ago, a, a year ago, um, the application process was a pretty straightforward application process. Um, in that process, I really tried to bring myself into that personal statement. And I know many of us have written personal statements for the college application process. And while I would not say that they're exactly the same, I certainly would say that when you're thinking about applying for this fellowship, really bring yourself into that personal statement and link it and sync it up with the work that you've done and would like to do around just technology um, in a variety of different dimensions. Um, and then when I was working on the project, I really was kind of trying to conceptualize what just technology meant to me and my work and the communities that I've been engaged with and would like to engage with and how I might participate with a, a group of people who would be my peers as Just Tech Fellows. I think one of the best things about this project is the opportunity to collaborate and to work with a, a cohort of people who are working in different dimensions and fields and areas. We're all committed to Just Technology. Um, and so I try to really capture this spirit of collaboration around community engagement, all things that people sort of uh, state and phrases sometimes are throwaway phrases. I really thought seriously about what that meant to me, how a community of scholars and a community of people were really lifesavers for me, both on and offline through uh, the pandemic and brought that forward into the application. Uh, I'll just say and end with a little bit about the fellowship and what I've experienced thus far. Um, it is a fellowship unlike any that I've ever experienced and I've had the fortunate opportunity to have at least one or two other fellowships. But what makes this fellowship so different is that baked into the fellowship is a community of spirit and care, just not for my work, but also for me as an individual. A meeting with my colleagues, both in person, which I had an opportunity to do uh, for a retreat this past summer, but certainly every month, um, touching base on our work, our personal lives, and then thinking about what a future of just technology looks like. So it's an incredible fellowship. I wish you the best of luck as you prepare to apply for it. Um, it is an opportunity that is a unique opportunity. And I know that if you're one of the fortunate people to get this fellowship, you will feel the way that I do that it's oh, it's valuable work that's widely supported so thank you I'm going to pass it off to Mimi now great thanks so much hey everyone 
Um, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. My name is Mimi Stiles. I get to be the president and the founder of this amazing Black woman-led um, research and data activism organization called Measure. Um, most of my uh, partners in this work, my sisters in justice and who I call them, um, we all identify as Afrofuturists. We also identify as data activists. We um, like to, you know, just hone the spirit of, of Ida B. Wells, of Katherine Johnson, of all of the Black women that have been um, in this work for, for many, for, for centuries, right? Um, you know, what comes up for me when I think about the Just Tech Fellowship is really the word restoration. I feel restored in this space. Um, and I say that with every bit of passion that I have in my bones and in my DNA, because I have been doing this work for quite some time, um, advocating for my community. I am an organizer. I, again, I am a data activist. Um, I have gone, you know, I've, I've, I'm one of those people that <clears throat> does the work I guess, to push back on traditional research um, in exchange for community-led protocol, protocols. And, um, and as such, I've, you know, my organization is developing um, ways in which communities can create research and can be the ones that say, this matters to me because we say so, and we are the ones with the solution. Um, so, in many cases, my project is a um, is not just my project. My project is really one that comes from my community. Um, we listened to what um, to what uh, our, our black and brown um, non uh, and indigenous led organizers needed, and what they told us that they needed was they needed each other. They needed a village, they needed a community by which they can share their impact, um, by which they're able to share data, um, create metrics that have more of a focus on um, racial impact or, or, um, or anti-oppression. They, they needed to be able to have a place where they can champion one another's work and progress, find funding, be more so um, uh, uh, intentionally supported by the philanthropic community that says that they are looking to support them. Um, and so that's really what my project is all about, is, develop, is, is asking the question, about, um, you know, what responsibility do we have as developers of technology to, to develop systems that are anti-racist? What does anti-racist technology look like? Um, and very, and even more specifically, how should researchers and community members evaluate the effectiveness of technologies that claim to combat structural racism and other forms of oppression? Right, so the so a, a deep question, but I believe that we, the community, have the answer. Far too often, we rely too too much on the technologist, or you know, and when in reality, we are the innovators. Um, I've learned through this through this relationship, and that's what I'm going to call the Just Tech Fellowship. Is that it's a relationship, and I've learned that it's essential for us to work together um, in, 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 in the development of these solutions. It's, it's really about, um, it's really, I, I think I found my village, to be honest with you. It's, it, it, it came to me at a time where it was, it's the hardest time of my life, to be honest with you. And I have now the opportunity to create a solution that, provides not only myself um, a possibility of justice, but also for my community. Um, the application to me was, was um, you know, I, I honestly wasn't sure about it, right? Because you always think in, in your mind about a fellowship, it's, you, you think it's super academic and all of the things. That's not me. You know, I kind of call myself a black academic, but that's not really me, right? And so I just, I did what I thought, what I knew to do. I, I wrote together, I, I put together a timeline of the actions that I know that I can take. I, I gave myself grace 
and I was responsible to my mental health and to my own self-care, even in my application. So Q1, I said, I'm going to do these deliverables, but I'm also going to make sure that I create a space for liberation and healing because these deliverables are going to have some sort of impact on me. I cannot go to my community and ask them, how do they feel about racism or how, how can I develop anti-racist technology and all of these very tough and challenging conversations without giving myself time to be, um, to heal from it. And so Just Tech, and I'll end with this, created that space so intentionally. The first thing that they did for us, with us, was invited us to heal. We went up to the mountain, you know, and we got to know one another and we, we, we ate good, healthy food and we had, you know, you know, treatments and, 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 and so forth in order to make sure that, you know, we were leaning into this next two year fellowship with a sense of responsibility to ourselves. We cannot create technology without being, without um, positioning healing as the first step. And so that's that's my my gratefulness. Actually, that's that's my gratitude rather to the Just Tech Fellowship. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Mimi. I'm so grateful to have you as part of the um, cohort. But um, today, I just want to manifest my great my gratefulness for having you here today and taking the time um, to do this info session. So now, um, also because of some of the things that the two of you said, and also some of the things that are asked in the chat, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the application process. Um, you heard the experiences that Kim and Mimi had, um, some things have changed from last year to facilitate the process and yeah, make it easier. And um, I just want to go over some, some of the questions that we got last year and this year that I think will help you as you prepare um, your application or make the decision to apply. Um, and the first one is, um, what do we mean by technology? Um, and it is true that technology can be many things, right, from a wheel to a computer. But um, our emphasis here is on novel technologies, digital technologies that, for example, comprise uh, include computers, the internet, data-driven platforms, and, and um, its intersection with power. Um, and um, now I want to talk a little bit about the eligibility and the selection criteria, because I think it is important for people to know what you know, what, what's going to happen once they submit their application with the process. Um, so I was saying before, um, we take a capacious view of research, um, and we're also aiming to have very diverse cohorts. And in this, we want to encourage again, or I want to encourage again, um, uh, to have people from very different backgrounds to apply. So this includes arts, journalism, civil society, and the social scientists, the humanities, and computer science, um, and some others that are not here, uh, but are in our other documents. Technologies, for example, um, are also very much welcome to apply. Um, because we want to build um, a strong cohorts and this, we're still um, in, in building phase, right? Like this is just our second year. Um, we require that people reside uh, on the, in the US. And in terms of education, um, it could either be a BA or an advanced degree. But what is more important for us, and I want to highlight this, is an equivalent experience and track record. Um, so we want to support people who has been working on technology and social justice for a while who can show that they that they've developed a career around this obviously there are different questions right somebody can have a career from two or three years and somebody can have a career from 20 years so it's more that you show that these are questions that you um are passionate about it but that you've been thinking about them for a while right like it's not that you created this project just for the application but that we can see your trajectory um, before the moment that, that, uh, of applying. And then um, the most important part for us is that you showed on your different materials the, the focus on technology and social justice, right? Like that has to come across um, the readers and the evaluators uh, and the selection committee. Um, now about the selection criteria. So um, we as the Just Tech program are not in charge of making any selections. Uh, we build and design the, the whole structure, but the selection um, is not in our hands. Um, it is in the hands of a group of 35 evaluators who come from very different backgrounds. Um, 
we have people working at Google, we have artists, we have um, technologies, we have community organizers, we have people working at the ACLU, lawyers. Um, and for us, it's important to have that diversity because we understand that the applications are also gonna be diverse, right? So there has to be a group of experts who will be able to understand those different types of um, expertise. And um, then it's passed to a selection committee, also composed of uh, people coming from very different backgrounds. And all of this information is available on our website and we'll be dropping um, the links in the chat. So what we ask to our evaluators and to members of the selection committee is that they pay attention to four things. The first one is the alignment of the project um, and the, the, candidate, the candidate with the fellowship goals that I presented at the beginning. Um, what is the scope? of their work, what is the clarity and the purpose of what they want to do. Um, we believe that this is a space for you to create something, which means that you are not, we, you're not bounded to only do the first, the, the same project that you um, uh, apply with, because we believe that, I mean, good ideas change over time, right? But we do want to see what is the scope of work, right? Like what are the sectors that you want to you wanna, uh, work about? And then, um, we also worried, um, not worried, but one of our priorities uh, is the public impact. And in this, I just wanna highlight that um, I think this is what differentiates us a little bit more with more academic fellowships. Um, we are not thinking, I mean, we understand the work and labor that goes into publishing in academic journals, but that is not the only purpose of this. It has to be clear in your application, what are the ramifications and the public impact that your proposal is gonna have? And this can take different forms, right? It can be, um, that you are going to be in conversations with policymakers, that you are going to be working with a think tank, that you are an advocacy organization, that you are planning to draft a book, right? But but it has to be clear that, um, that it has a public impact. And then collaboration. And this is important. Um, as Mimi and Kim were mentioning, we are advocating for a strong cohort. Some of our fellows are already collaborating in things. Um, we, I mentioned it when I was talking about the goals. Um, and then... The other thing is like, it is true that the fellowship focuses on individuals and not on organizations, but that doesn't mean that we don't, our, our view is that um, people are working with their communities and that there is collaboration, right? So, so we have to see that in the, in the, in the proposal. Um, now, I want to talk about um, navigating the application. So we have simplified the application. You don't have to submit an intention form anymore. You go directly to applying. Um, the application portal opened um, 10 days ago in December 6th and will close um, the last day to submit your applications is midnight of January 30th, sorry, by 11.59 p.m. Um, then eligibility and selection process will take place between February and April of next year. And we are planning to, ex to announce the second cohort of Just Tech Fellows in May. 2023 and the fellowship will begin in the summer for a tenure of two years so from 2023 to 2025. Um, there are um, once you go and you open your application there are a series of questions general questions that you need to answer but we're only asking for three uh, materials the first one is your resume a two-page resume the second one is a personal statement that can be also a video or it can be a written document a, a work proposal and then samples of work, but that is suggested is not mandatory. Um, you will have a space to add two samples of work if you feel that that's something that that you want to do, but it's not mandatory. And um, now, and and especially because of what Kim and Mimi were saying, I want to talk very briefly about the Just Tech Fellowship programming, right? So the fellowship, um, the idea is that you will take the necessary time to develop this um, work. If you have an ascription right now, we ask um, that you take at least one of the uh, one year off from that job responsibility or ascription that you have, um, and um, you will be part of the just the community. And we do different things to um, keep our community together, but also to network among ourselves, to network with other people, but also and more especially to take care of each other. So we do community calls that are usually led by fellows. Um, and they can be about different topics. We have a system of accountability partners. So fellows are always working with another one, checking in, how is your work? How is life going? Um, we have check-ins, monthly check-ins with Just Tech leadership. Um, so the program 
can know what is it that the fellows need and be able to design workshops and events that respond to the particular needs of the fellows. Uh, workshops and a speaker series um, that are intimate spaces with uh, leading figures in, in the uh, different people working in, in the space of public interest technology. Um, project planning and implementation and work shares. And we also do an annual retreat. If you are a fellow, you're expected to attend two of those retreats. Last year, um, yeah, last year was in, in the CAT skills. We are planning the next one. We don't know yet where it's going, going to be. Um, so um, I'm gonna leave it here because I wanna make sure that we have a space to answer some questions. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, BJ. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that overview of the um, application process and the criteria, and even just like how to navigate um, the application. Super, super clear and useful information. And I do see that folks have been asking some questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much, folks, for dropping your questions in there. We won't necessarily be able to answer all of them, as you can probably already imagine. Um, but we are tracking them and we will get to some right now. And then for those that we cannot get to, we're actually gonna share a link uh, for you to subscribe to the mailing list where you can access an FAQ that will be updated uh, with more answers to these questions. Great. So let's start, um, thank you, there in the chat box, as you all can see, there's a link to the FAQ. So some of your questions that you may have already asked may be there. And for those that are not, we're gonna continue to update that FAQ to include some new ones. But let's start, um, Kata, with just some of the, the most common ones that I can see also resonate with some of the questions that are coming up here in the Q&A. Um, the first is, can um, applicants submit collaborative or group applications? Yeah, um, I just want to highlight um, the applications have to be individual applications. Um, we do not accept applications from organizations. And um, the reason for this is that we have this model that we are very invested on of supporting the whole person. And we believe that if you're supported as a whole, you can also help your organization. So um, the, the support that we provide um, to individuals is $100,000 a year. That means that in, in total $200,000 because the tenure for the fellowship is a two year tenure. Um, and um, we are also thinking that it, and then you will get also supplementary funding. And we also have other sources of funding to uh, facilitate collaboration uh, among the Just Tech Fellows. Um, and I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, one more thing. Um, no, I'll stop there. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Great. Yeah, and that answered another question that had popped up about whether or not the 100, um, K was per year or for the entire fellowship. So thanks for, for also highlighting that it's each year as well. Okay, so a few folks asked this question in the Q&A box in different ways. The question is, do people have to reside in the US? Um, do they have to be US citizens? If they reside in the US, um, how much of the year do they need to do that? And um, will will SSRC sponsor visas? Sorry, that's like four questions in one, but <laughs> that those were the ones that came up. Yeah, I think this is one of the the limits that we have, which is that we cannot sponsor um, visas. Um, so that um, will have to fall on the person's uh, responsibility. Um, we ask that people reside in the U.S. Uh, for the term of the fellowship. There are plans for the future to have a more global print. Um, but this is um, one of the requirements that we have right now. Um, we have different breaks built into um, the fellowship. So we take, um, I think it's a total, if you combine all the time, we will end up taking a total of four months pause, um, one in the winter, one month in the summer, and then a uh, fall break and a spring break. So this to give you a sense of when programming happens and when do you have to be um, tuned to it. And I think this answers all the questions, Billy. Am I right? 
the four yeah, questions? I have, I have one follow-up question on that too. Um, if folks are US-based, could their projects be focused on issues or, or programs that are outside of the US? Oh yeah, no, they don't have to be um, uh, about the US. Um, it can be people who is working about projects um, in other places um, of the world. And in this, I think it will also be helpful to clarify that the 100,000 a year are unrestricted funds. You decide what to do with them. And then the supplementary fund, then uh, we also do not dictate how you use um, that money. Um, that depends on you. If you decide that you want those 30,000 to go back to your organization or to use the 30,000 pain for something more um, personal as um, healthcare for your family members, that is your decision. We don't uh, intervene with that. Um, what it is worth noticing also is that if you are keeping your current ascription, we do not pay overhead. Um, yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't pay overhead to institutions. Um, there are scenarios in which people uh, want to root um, the 100,000 through the organization, that is possible. Um, the supplementary funding cannot be rooted through an organization, uh, precisely because it goes to the individual. So we want to be very um, mindful about that. Great. Thank you for that. So can you say a little bit more now about the candidates? Like who are the ideal candidates and what are you looking for in terms of their seniority or their experience in the field or their level of expertise, type of work, et cetera, who would you say is the, the ideal candidate? Ah, that's a great question. I think they're ideal candidates. Um, I wouldn't like close it to just one. And um, in this, I invite you to check um, the profiles of all the um, Just Tech Fellows that we have now. And Mimi, you're here. Feel free to, to jump. Um, they couldn't be more different among themselves. <laughs> Right, so we have two people who are um, faculty. We have Mimi, who is a community organizer. Uh, we have a lawyer working in DC doing advocacy. Um, we have uh, Christine, who is a community organizer and is in the ground. Uh, Mimi, I'm not saying that you're not in the ground. <laughs> I mean, just guy like that. But people with very different careers. And um, I think there is also a lot of diversity in uh, how old they are and their years of experience in the field. So I know sometimes we just want to, you know, have like an exact answer because that, get, you know, certainty is, is a really nice thing in life. Um, but I'm going to play a little bit with the uncertainty, right, which is uh, we are open to give to people to make the case, right? And once again, you know, maybe in the last five years, you've done amazing work, right? Um, maybe somebody else has done 15 years. Maybe somebody started three years ago, right? Um, so I think that's that's something good about our fellowship um, that encourages diversity. And in that, I would say that they are ideal candidates and not only one. I just want to highlight again, it's people who has a trajectory of work. It's people who sees their work as having a public impact. It's people who is invested on doing collaboration. Um, and it's people who is very much working at the intersection of technology and social justice. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And you and spoke to the, the trajectory that folks have some track record. There was a question in the Q&A box that I noticed that was asking about if, if it can also be a new project or if it has to be new in any way. It can be a new project, right? I mean, there are things that we do in life that we feel like we solve it, and they, you know, they don't need more attention. I think that, and this is this goes back to us funding a person, right? The trajectory of work of that person. Um, I know, for instance, one of the things uh, we do not fund um, dissertation projects. Uh, but if you are someone who is finishing your PhD and you are envisioning this whole new project by all means you should apply right um what we just what i want to be very clear is that we don't so this is not a dissertation completion fellowship we don't we don't support that uh now the other thing and and i i'm just going back to the question about individuals of organizations um it's completely fine if more than one person applies from the same organization um and you know we're assuming you're very different people so there is no reason why, why that shouldn't be the case great Okay, let's see if we can um, answer one or two more um, in this time that we have. So 
another one that is uh, common um, and come up comes up uh, quite a bit is do people um, applicants need to have an institutional affiliation and how can how can people manage time away if they're taking time off in order to participate in this fellowship? Um, how do they right. manage that? Uh, can you repeat the first one? Sorry, I went with Yeah, do people one. need to have an institutional affiliation? All right. Yeah, they don't. Um, and um, yeah, you don't need to have an institutional affiliation. If during the tenure of the fellowship, you think that being part of uh, an institution can can help you, we, we, we will facilitate that. But um, we understand that it's hard to take time off from a job. Um, and this is why we are not asking you to uh, quit your job um, for two years, but we, we are asking for at least one year to be off. Um, at the end, you're gonna get over $100,000 a year and we're hoping and we understand people have very different needs and possibilities in the world. We're not saying that this is how you should live, but what we are offering to people is enough funding for them to be able to take time away. We understand that sometimes this means negotiating with employers. So I'm thinking about journalists for which it's very hard to have like a permanent position or um, even tenure track faculty. Um, we are happy to um, think about a way of negotiating this, right? Like maybe you only take one semester each year, right? So it doesn't feel like you abandon your position a full year. Like there are ways in which we can play with this, but um, in those two years, we want to make sure that for one full year, um, you are only doing um, the fellowship. And the, the other rationale for this is that we don't want you to be teaching six classes and then also having to do the fellowship because that's not gonna be productive, right? And um, then it, it turns into you having two or three jobs. Right, and that's a lot. That is a lot. And as Mimi said earlier, this is also um, a relationship. So on top of the project work that you're doing, participating in the fellowship also requires another level of um, capacity. Um, so, yeah. Okay, we are we have a little bit of extra time, got that. And I'm wondering if um, you'd be okay with me pulling maybe one more question just from the yes. Q&A here. Um, there was one that was a bit more logistical, um, just about the supplementary funding and the portion of that that go, can go to project funds. So the question itself is approximately how much is the supplementary funding and what portion of that can go to the project funds or do those two things have to stay like completely separate? Yeah, um, so approximately it will be $30,000 a year plus the 100,000. Um, and um, once again, we do not dictate how you use this money. Um, the only thing is that if you decide to root um, the funds through your institution, um, those $30,000 cannot be rooted through, through your institution. And um, I'm also gonna take this space to answer um, something that I explained partially, but I didn't finish. Um, we are only asking for the requirements that we have listed. Uh, there are other questions that you also have to answer in the application. Uh, but as requirements that you have to prepare um, is the resume. Um, there is a two page resume. I know CVs and resumes can go. I've seen CVs in my life of 35 pages. Um, but we ask you that you, you know, at the end is an exercise of creating the resume and putting into pages um, the most important things that you think people should be paying attention to in your application. Wonderful. And this has kind of excited me that it's popped up a few times here. I, the the sense of community that is built within this fellowship also, you know, extends beyond it in a way. I, I am excited that I've gotten to be a collaborator and participate in this community. And folks um, in this group right now who are here for the info session have also asked about that. Like, are there other ways to participate in this community? Like. If we don't make it, can we still vibe? <laughs> Essentially. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is the really hard part about this job. Um, last year, we got close to past um, five hundred applications, and we only were able to fund six fellows. Um, this year, we're hoping that the number will be between eight and ten, which which is still small. I wish the world was different and we could be funding more people. Um, and there are other ways of collaborating. So. Um, 
we provide feedback to people who pass the second and the third um, part of the application process. Um, and um, if you are someone who applied last year, you can ask for that feedback this year. Um, but um, we only give it to people who ask for. Um, and then um, I will highlight here the work that we're doing with the platform, which is really important. We have different types of content there. We have interviews, we have essays, we have field reviews. And that is another way of collaborating um, with us. So I'm very happy actually to say last year, two of the finalists who didn't make it, uh, we just published um, an article by one of them and we're gonna publish another one um, in the spring. And yeah, maybe we can put the article in the chat so people see uh, what, what um, they were working about. Um, we also invite you to register to our mailing list. Um, there will be also a public events. So there are other spaces in which we can um, help people join the community and we're happy to, to see it grow. Fantastic. Yeah, maybe actually let's go to that next slide that we have where people can see some of the links. Again, we weren't able to get to all of the questions here, but um, please do uh, join the mailing list and you can um, get more information there. There's also a link in the chat box now that can connect you to the FAQ, which will continue to get updated with questions that we haven't been able to answer. And there is an email that you can um, use for any direct questions that you have. Um, I, I saw some things about like the deliverables and if people will get feedback and um, just more kind of de details about the application or the process itself. So feel free to email us at just-tech at ssrc.org with those questions. Visit us at www.ssrc.org slash just tech, the mailing list I've already mentioned. And all that's left to do after that is start your application. And we are very, very excited to hear from you, to receive your applications. I just learned today that half of the people who start their applications don't actually finish them. So get started soon, get started early and reach out for help when you feel stuck, when you feel unclear, when maybe you just need a little bit of encouragement, please do feel free to reach out, know that we're here for you. We wanna see you um, and we're excited to hear from you and see um, a lot of these uh, project ideas come through. So if there's anything else, Katha, you'd like to share or anyone else, on the team before we wrap up. Just wanna open it up to you for any last words. Uh, no, just that uh, please send us uh, messages if you have a specific questions. Um, there are also the materials that we share on the chat that have um, what we hope are extensive explanations, but we're open to all of your questions and inquiries all the time. Um, I think I saw one question that was, um, what if we, you wanna get feedback from last year? You should email us and we'll make sure to um, share that information with you. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Um, yeah, the other questions about reporting and all of that should be on the FAQ. But um, I just, I actually am going to close uh, with something that I said before, but I think it will be very, very useful here. The reporting is not intense and it's also not bounding. And the reason for this is because we truly want to invest in the person and give you the time and space for you to create. Um, once again, we understand that projects change over time. Um, so maybe you propose something and in the first semester you have conversations and experiences and something happened in the world that um, asks you to tweak or make substantial changes. That's um, also that's also fine. But right now the reporting that we have is every six months, um, two pages, just letting us know how you're doing. What is more important for us is that if you get the fellowship, you are an active part of the community. And to have a community, you have to put work and time. Um, so I will say in terms of a requirement, that's more of a requirement than submitting a form or, or um, any other document that is more traditional of other fellowships or grants. And yeah, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Mimi, and everyone else on the Just Tech team who's been supporting tech and slides and um, helping out in the Q&A today. Appreciate everybody's efforts. And again, look forward to seeing your applications, everyone. Enjoy your weekends. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.